Thank you. So good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord. And if you're joining us online as well, thank you so much for being with us online. It's a great day to sit down and be in church. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing on in our series, Living Hope. Living Hope. And last week I preached a message entitled, Trials, Trials, Trials. Does anyone want to take a guess what it was about? Trials, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, let me just move this over here. Everything's got to be square for me. Okay, that's better. There we go. It was about trials. And uh, this week we're going to continue on. Uh, we've been taking the, the, the book of First Peter, and we've been taking it about three verses at a time, and really just breaking this thing down. And how many know that a, a good breakdown of the Word of God is, is a very fruitful thing? It's a very fruitful thing. I think we've learned a lot of things along the way. Um, this morning, it's going to look a little bit different. We're not going to have a main scripture and be breaking it down. Uh, we're going to make some practical application now to where we find ourselves in the book of First Peter. And I've entitled this this morning, Putting Our Problems into Perspective. Putting Our Problems into Perspective. Let's start out with this, though, this morning, that how many know that there is a purpose behind your problems and your trials because they're meant to fortify your faith. They're meant to strengthen your faith. And we discovered some of that last week, and I'll continue to break it down for you. Last week, we talked about the fact that our trials are temporary. How many are thankful for that? They're temporary. Our trials are timely. How many know that trials are terrible? Look at your neighbor and say, trials are terrible. See, that, that, that just feels good, doesn't it? Trials are terrible. We also learned that trials are transforming when we respond to them correctly. And we need to respond to trials. We need to respond to problems. We need to respond to hurt that we experience in life correctly. Last week, we looked at four ways that we can grow up. We can grow in during trials and in difficulties. Trials strengthen our faith. How many know that an untested faith is an unproven faith? We talked about the refiner's fire. We talked about the fine that, man, sometimes the heat just gets jacked up in life. And how many know what happens? Man, things start to bubble to the surface. And sometimes those things aren't good. And it's those impurities and it's those things. And, uh, and it tests our faith. It tests our resolve as well. So it's developing something. Trials deepen our love. Trials deepen our love. We studied the word yet. In Job 13.8, it says this, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. In that word yet brings us to a decision. And how many know, man, when, when it comes to God and it comes to problems, when problems come, we have a decision to make. Okay, God, I'm going to go along with this, or you know what, God, I'm, I, I, I don't like your way of doing this. I'm, I'm just done. I'm just done. Or we can use a trial and say, all right, Lord, I'm going to dig in and I'm going to go deeper with you. I'm going to go deeper in you. It grows our love. It deepens our love as we make the decision to trust him. Trials grow our joy. We can have an inner certainty that God is developing us. How many know God's up to something? Look at your Listen, come on church, we got to wait. We we got to be active this morning. We got to be awake. Look at your neighbor and say God's up to something. He is up to something. Trials help our hope. They help our hope. First Peter 1 Peter 1.9, the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. And who is thankful for that? We have that blessed hope, man. This world is not our home, and I am so thankful that God is indeed up to something. And he uses trials to fortify and grow things inside of us that are eternal. Now listen, if you're going to grow something, if you're going to go to the work of doing something, how many want that thing to last? And that's exactly what God's saying here. And, and, and as we learned last week, is that he wants eternal things in our lives. 1 Corinthians 13, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. So it's amazing to me that three eternal things that God uses problems and difficulties and trials to produce something that's everlasting 
inside of us. And I'm thankful for that. So let me see if I can bring this together this morning with five ways to put our problems into perspective. Because how many of you want victory? Amen? We want victory. All right, so when times are hard, when we can know that God's at work in our trials for our good and certainly for his glory. So number one this morning is this. Number one is confess your bitterness to God. Confess your bitterness to God. Friends, bitterness will short-circuit God's plan to use your problems for his purposes. Bitterness is bad news, all right? And it'll short-circuit what God wants to do. Now listen, let me just balance this by saying this, that God, I believe that God is able to, uh, to understand and is able to okay with us expressing anger and ex- expressing resentment, expressing the fact that, God, I really don't like going through this. How many know that those are, create, those are emotions that he created? And he can handle that. Scripture says to be angry and what? Sin not. Sin not. So it's not a matter of casting it on God. It's not a matter of blaming God for these things, but telling him what you're going through and telling him your emotions. The problem is, though, is that some people just take it to a next level, and instead of angry, they, they, we have individuals, and you're just, you're just brimming with bitterness. Bitterness. Resentment. Bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 cautions us on that. And it says this, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows. Now listen, if you have a weed in your flower bed, how do you get rid of it? By the, you want to pull the root out. You can't allow a root of bitterness. Bitterness is one of those things, and and we'll talk about it just here in a second. It just kind of lurks under the surface. Lurks under the surface. You've got to pull it out. For some people, it starts with recognizing resentment. We have to to be cognizant of the fact that that we're beginning to uh, have resentment. So let's be honest with this this morning. Resentfulness is a very subtle but real temptation. Is it not? It's very subtle, but a real temptation in people's hearts, especially people, and especially during times of deep sorrow, of pain, and trials. It's really easy to get resentful. But over time, we have to learn the importance of how to recognize this temptation when it comes. Listen, you don't even want to start down the path of being resentful. It's important to understand that we can take steps to realign our heart. Man, when, you're, when you begin to get resentful, you can realign your heart with the truth of the Word of God. But I'm thankful that the Word of God kind of gives us a snapshot of what resentfulness looks like. And we see this example in Psalm 73. And uh, I, I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but uh, I'll, I'll highlight it here for you this morning. Psalm 73, we see here that it temporar- temporarily travels down this road of resentment. And the psalmist is being resentful towards the wicked. And let me read it for you. Um, and, and his beef is, is, well, everything just goes real good for the wicked. And this is what he says in Psalm 73. Behold... These are the wicked, always at ease. They never, they are always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain, I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocent. How many got family members like that, right? How many know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. It goes on to say, for all day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Can you see the resentment in this portion of Scripture? And if that's the posture of your heart, I just encourage you, man, to check this. I'm thankful that by God's grace, the psalmist doesn't get stuck there. If you read the entire chapter, it continues to show us how God can turn a resentful heart into a grateful heart. But we can't allow bitterness to short-circuit what God wants to do and how he wants to use your problems for his 
purposes. I talked to someone recently who said he had stopped going to church and started isolating himself. Let me talk to you real quick about isolation here for just a moment this morning. Isolation is the devil's playground. It's the devil's playground. If the devil can isolate you, he is winning. If he can get you to think that, oh man, all that bad stuff, that just happens to you. That just happens to you. You're out on this all by yourself. No one understands. No one understands this and that. If he can get you to a place of isolation that you start pulling away, man, that's where he wants to devour you. That's where he wants to devour you. It's a devil's playground. But I was talking to this man who stopped going to church. He began to isolate himself. He was bitter over something his ex-wife had done to him years earlier. Years earlier. You think of the implications here. She was still controlling him years later because he was embittered. Because he was resentful in a situation. I rarely preach on this topic without giving you this one-liner, and I told him this as well. That bitterness is like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. Be sure to confess your bitterness to God and pull it out by the roots. Secondly, this morning, give up your demand to know why you're going through pain. Give up your demand to know why you're going through pain. No matter how hard we try to figure it out. How many of you are analytical? You just have, that's, I, I'm, I'm right in that boat. I want to know why it's happening, and, and I'm preaching to myself here this morning. But we have to understand that there is going to be mystery in the misery sometimes. There's going to be mystery in the pain. There's going to be mystery in the trial. We're not always going to know why. And here's the bottom line, and can I just tell you this? God does not explain himself to us, nor does he have to. Because he's God and we're not. Can I just tell all of you, <laughs> we're not. We are not. He is. We would do well to remember that we're, there's times that we need to rest in God's sovereignty. Rest in his sovereignty. Well, sovereignty, what are, we, what are we talking about here? The sovereignty of God can be defined as the exercise of his supremacy. His infinite rule, his authority and power being infinitely elevated above the highest creature in authority, nature, and being. He is the most high Lord of the heavens and earth in all of creation. I mean, we're talking about the top of the food chain. The top of the food chain. So basically, God's sovereignty means that he's the supreme ruler And he rules personally over all of the affairs of the universe. And this also includes our personal lives. Think about that for a minute. The same God who hung the stars is the same God who rules over your and my life. Kind of put some things in perspective a little bit. This includes our personal lives, both as individuals. This also includes the direction of our church as well, as a body of believers as well. God's sovereignty is a place of rest for his children. And listen, when we get it, and when we can get past the fact that we don't know why, there's rest to be found in the fact that, you know what? That guy, that God hung all them stars. My problems are the least of his worries. He's got this under control. There's rest to be found in the sovereignty of God. One particular place we can find rest in the application in relationship with God's sovereignty is this. His guidance and work to accomplish his purposes in our lives. He's up to something in our lives. Sometimes we just don't need to know why he's up to something. I think that Paul had this in mind, at least in part in first, in, uh, not first Philippians, in Philippians 1. Uh, he says this, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it. 
will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, we don't need to know why. We just need to know that he's working. We sing that song that he's moving even when we don't see it. He's moving. He's working on you and I. Number three, number three, give God the right to say no to you. Give God the right to say no to you. How many love the word no? Ask any toddler. That's their favorite word. (laughs) Give God the right to say no. God has the right to say no, but I think that it's important, though, that we come to grips. It's important for us to admit this, that God simply has the right to tell you no. No. Um, how many of you, you know, your, your mom could win any battle growing up just simply with four words? Because I said so. No. Why? Because I said so. Come on, mom. God has the right to tell us no. Now, we see this modeled in the, in the, in the Scripture. We see this modeled in the life of Paul. We also see this modeled in the life of Jesus, and we'll look at both of them here this morning really quickly. Firstly, uh, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 12, when he prayed three times for the suffering to be taken away, uh, another translation says that he literally begged God to take the suffering for it to be gone, and God's answer to him was a resounding no. 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 But he said, my grace is all you need. My grace is all you need. It's important for us to remember that even in the no, come on, church, stay with me here this morning. Even in the no, we still have that amazing grace to help us through this morning. Let's look at the story of Jesus in Mark 14, 36. Jesus was even told no. By the Father. Jesus is praying to the Father here in Mark 14, and he says this Abba Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Man, Jesus is asking the Father, Lord, I really don't want to go through this. And God says, no, son, you're going to have to drink of this bitter cup. And aren't you thankful that he did? Because it was a game changer for you and I. You know, I find this interesting that suffering came to Paul and to Jesus, not because they were out of the Father's will, but because they were in the Father's will. Listen, we got to give God the space sometimes to say no to us. It's okay, God, to say no, because I know that even in your no, I still have your amazing grace. Number four, number four, use your suffering as means to minister to others. Use your suffering as means to minister to others. Listen, Paul wanted this thorn in his flesh removed so that he could get on with ministry, But he learned that after his ailment that it multiplied his ministry. And we see this multiplication thing going on. And and, and it's interesting. And consider this thought with me this morning. Have you ever thought about how God could use you to help someone who's going through the very same suffering that you've been through? Can I tell you how this multiplies? Can I tell you, give you a snapshot out of my life? I can tell you this, that through the trials and through the struggles that I've been through, through the, the struggle of pornography in my life and seeing that, that bondage broken, I can look a man who's struggling with pornography dead in his eyes and say this to him, you can overcome this with Jesus Christ. This can This does not have to defeat you any longer. It's multiplication of ministry. I don't even, they don't even have to admit it. It's it's to the point that I can identify with that person simply as I rub shoulders with them. I can see the shame. I can see the look. I can see the the feeling. And instantly I can tell that individual is dealing with pornography. 
That's a multiplication of the ministry. And what I find so interesting is last week we talked about, how many know it was taught various trials, various problems. When we come together as a church, how many know that the same problem I have isn't the same problem you have? Is it the same problem your neighbor has? And as we go through these things, as we go through these trials and and, and these things, that we're all going through different things and it's to meet the needs of different people. Doesn't that make us a little bit more effective as a church? We use your sufferings as means to ministering to others. I know of individuals who have just been, health-wise, have just been lambasted with all kinds of health issues. They're at the doctors constantly. That's an opportunity. Every doctor, every nurse, every person they talk to to give credit and give glory and honor to the name of God. Use it as a ministry. You know, what have you walked through? Maybe you've walked through depression. Maybe you've walked through bankruptcy. Maybe you, you've walked through uh, financial peril. Maybe you've walked through divorce. Maybe you've walked through the loss of a child. You've walked through these things. You have a ministry gift. You have a ministry gift. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. This is a big part of God's purpose in comforting you in your pain. It says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Look at your neighbor and say, all comfort. This again is talking about that grace of God that even wanted to know, guess what? You still have his comfort. No matter the trial, no matter the problem that you're going through, he is there to comfort you. It goes on to say, who comforts us in all our trials, in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. You see, it always goes back to him. It always goes back to him. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. Number five this morning, make sure that your trials are not self-inflicted. Make sure that your trials, your problems, are not self-inflicted. We need to make sure that the trials and problems we're facing aren't simply a result of disobedience. You know, when we entertain disobedience in our life, it begins to take root. It begins to take root in our lives. And how many know that as we disobey and as we, we do that and we live in a state of disobedience in one area of our life, how many know what it produces? It produces problems, doesn't it? It produces trials. And we can't expect there to be blessing. We can't expect there to be assurance and ease in areas of our lives that are disobedient. Areas where we're not willing to deal with the fact that this is the truth and I need to move in obedience. I need to pay attention to the detail of obedience. So generally what we do is we'll take this disobedience thing and we try to uh, we try to change it. There's an old saying that goes like this. You can polish and polish and polish, but a turd is still a turd. It's the same thing with sin. It's the same thing with disobedience. We can try, and and what we do is we begin to justify. We begin to justify disobedience. We begin to justify sin by, well, let's let's shade it. Let let, let me throw this thought on it or or this reasoning. And, And all the while, you're getting away from the word. You're getting away from God's reasoning, and you begin to justify. 
And then generally what happens is, is you begin to tell someone of this problem that you have because it's rooted in sin. And then your friend and your Christian brother and sister bring the godly assurance that, oh, God will work it out. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And the problem is, is that it's rooted in sin. It's rooted in sin. This is why it's so important for us to have people in our lives that will call us out on things when we begin to justify and we begin to smear the line between truth and lie and sin and obedience. Absolutely important to have those individuals in our lives. The issue is when we place assurances on problems and trials that are rooted in disobedience. Let me talk to you about assurances for a minute. There are things like this. God is good. God's got this. Don't worry. God's in control. God will take care of you. How many of you have heard these catchy assurance phrases before? You've heard them a thousand times. But what I'm saying to you this morning is we can't just for the sake of our minds because we want to change something into something spiritual, throw Christian assurances on it when it's just straight disobedience. Let me try to break this down a little bit more for us this morning. The fact is, is that all of these assurances of God are true. Are they not? This is what we've been talking about for two weeks, man. When problems come, we can be assured that God is for us. God's going to take care of it. All of these things. But we can't attach those same assurances to disobedience. God is good. He is in control. Absolutely. He wants to lead your life. He wants to direct you and give you provision for life. The best life you can have in Christ Jesus. But you know, I think that there are times... In our lives, where we simply live in direct disobedience to what the Lord's saying. Because we want to throw our two cents in it as well. Let me try to bring this out. Let me try to illustrate this to you. I think of Adam. How many know that Adam messed up pretty bad? (laughs) And it was very clear. And I think of the regret that Adam must have had as he walked out of the Garden of Eden, knowing that he would never again return to a place of perfection. Think about what was weighing on his shoulders and on his mind at that moment. Going back, knowing that there was never going to be face-to-face personal fellowship with the Lord ever again. He failed to follow the command of God. And the command was, don't partake of that tree. Don't partake of the tree. I'm sure in his mind he had to have been replaying all of the decisions that led up to that fateful decision that how many know we're all still dealing with today as the fall of man? <laughs> Amen. There's Thank you. Thank you, sister. We're still dealing with. He had failed to follow God's explicit command, and now he's forced to live a life full of sin, in imperfection, And he was going to have to toil. He was going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. So let's go. And now that I've set that picture, let's just go on a little bit of a fictional narrative here for a little bit. All right? Let's throw some uh, godly assurances on sin here. We'll see how this comes out. So indulge me for a minute. We're going to make this up. Let's imagine that Joe Christian, all right? Joe Christian is standing just outside the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Joe sees the dejected look on Adam and Eve's face as they come out. Uh, They're they're upset, they're ashamed, uh, guilty of of disobeying God's order. And Joe, being the wonderful, encouraging Christian guy that he is, stops them, grabs them by the hand, smiles at them, and with excitement and joy in his voice says, listen, don't worry about this, guys. God's got this. He's good. He's doing this for a reason. God's ways are higher than your ways. We don't know why God allowed this, but have faith. It's going to be all right. How many of you see that we're attaching the assurances of God to a problem that was created because of disobedience? Are you picking up what I'm putting down here this morning? So it begs the question this morning, what is our level of obedience? What does that look like? 
the assurances of God's provision in our lives should always be vetted against our behavior. Our behavior. Let me unpack this just a little bit more here. There's a story in 1 Samuel. And the story is about disobedience to an explicit command that God gave Saul through the prophet Samuel. And God told Samuel, I want you to let Saul know that I'm settling accounts with this certain group of people that had been messing around with my people earlier, and it's time that they pay the piper. So he's going to send Saul in there, and he says, I want you to wipe them completely out. Take them all. Take them all out. So Saul, the king of Israel at that point, went, and instead of killing everyone, instead of doing what the Lord said, what did Saul do? He kept the best, the fatted calves. He kept the, these, all of these things because he was going to sacrifice it unto God. Well, we see that that didn't go so well because the prophet Samuel caught up with him in verse 22, and it says this. He says this to Saul. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offering and sacrifice or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the offering of the fatted ram. There's a key word in there, submission. Submission. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid problems that come from a place of disobedience, that are rooted in disobedience? Can I submit to you this morning that it's very simple? We do exactly what the psalmist did. Lord, search my heart. Search my heart and point out any wicked way. Church, it's getting to the place in your walk with God that you withhold nothing from him. That even your preconceived ideas of, of, of life and these things are wide open for the inspection of the Lord, for him to come through, that nothing is hidden. And as the Holy Spirit points it out, guess what you do with it then at that point? You repent of it, you turn and go the other way. And do you know what our God does then with that problem? He turns it around for good because of his love for us. Obedience is such a key. It's such a key. How many know that's not a very popularly preached thing right now? I could fill a church if I could just stand up here and tell you, hey, listen, everyone, do whatever you want. You'll be fine. We'll all make it to heaven together. How many know that's just the tickling of ears? But the truth of the word is simply this, that he's coming back for a bride, a spotless one. And obedience is key for each one of us. I close this morning with with some thoughts on obedience. All of these are words from Jesus. Our obedience to God is a reflection of our love for him. John 14, 15 says this, the words of Jesus, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Our obedience to God brings the assurance of blessing, and I'm thankful for that, Luke eleven twenty eight. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And keep it. The last one, obedience to God was never promised to be easy. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter, it, enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. We need to make sure, church, that our trials aren't self-inflicted. And we simply do that by keeping an open heart and being obedient to the word of God. Not a portion of the word of God. Not what's convenient, but to the total word of God. So putting our problems in perspective, confess your bitterness, man. 
None of us have time for resentment and bitterness. Number two, give up your demand to know why you're going through what you're going through. Trust in the sovereignty of God. He's got you. You don't need to know why. Someday we'll know why when we get there. Number three, give God the right to say no. Give him the right to say no. Got to give him space. Number four, use your sufferings as means to minister to others. Each one of us is given a great testimony because we've been through a lot of things. Number five, make sure that your trials are not self-inflicted. Keep an open heart unto the Lord and live daily in his forgiveness and obedience to his word. Let's close this morning in prayer. Father, we love you. Father, I thank you that we can make practical uh, practical. Uh, application to your word, Lord. And God, as we've gone through this f- so far in, in First Peter, Lord, I thank you for the journey that we've been on. And I thank you for the growth, Lord, that ensues. So, Father, I pray that this morning, by the truth of your word, that you've used me this morning to challenge your people. To challenge your people, Lord, even those that are sitting in this room, Lord, those that are listening online, those that might be listening months from now, Lord, that practical application to your word has been made this morning. God, that we might grow deeper in our walks with you. We thank you, Father God, Lord, that it's not a sprint, Lord God. It's a marathon, Lord. And we condition and we grow along the way. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your faithfulness to each one of us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and ask all of these things. Amen.